Um, but as I said, first of all, I'm just going to start with some general principles around planning COVID secure events, because I think that no matter what happens in um, the social laws and the contact uh, laws in terms of how many people are allowed to gather and whether we need to social distance with friends and family, um, I'm a strong believer that they will uh, keep the requirement for a risk assessment for professional business type um, engagements. I think you'll still have to do COVID measures in workplaces and in, um, uh, yeah, in business events, if possible. I think they're going to add lots of lovely grey stuff about if possible, where possible, um, uh, and it's up to the business to create that um, justification. So I still think this process is going to be very valid. It's just that the, the measures we're used to seeing, hopefully, won't be so draconian. You know, we'll, we'll rely more on things that are easy to have in place and, and just stay there, like screens and um, possibly one-way systems. But we won't have so many reliance on, you know, strict social distancing and things like that. But I still do think that the principles behind um, reducing the risk of transmission will be valid. So that's kind of the, the general um, environment in which this is this is all being said. OK, so um, the first thing that we need to do uh, at the moment is understand the law that we're working in and the responsibilities that we have there. Um, there's two main points here. The first one is that we are um, always bound and will always be bound by the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974. Um, which puts a responsibility on employers to keep their employees and anyone affected by their work um, safe from harm. Uh, and also they have a requirement under the Associated Management, Regulate, Management of Health and Safety Regulations um, to carry out a risk assessment. And if there's more than five people in the company, write it down. That's not going to change. COVID is considered a risk, it's considered a hazard by the HSE, a significant hazard no less. Um, so uh, I think it's very important to understand that, uh, either if you're a venue, if you're an agent, if you're a corporate client, um, we do have a responsibility not to put people in harm's way at our event. So that's the first one. The second one is more specific, it's coronavirus legislation, it changes in name, no, depending on what they've issued and when, uh, you can um, find the latest list uh, on the government legislation site and there's links to that uh, from my website hub, uh, which you can find. But the main point is that regardless of what that legislation is called, regardless of which version we're in, um, there has always been this um, statement it just changes uh, regulation number occasionally at the moment it's regulation seven um, the gathering organizer or as the case may be the manager must take the required precautions and the first requirement is that the gathering organizer or manager has carried out a risk assessment um, and the second requirement is that you take all reasonable measures to limit the risk of transmission taking into account any guidance issued by the government. Now, we'll have a look at that in a minute, the guidance. Um, but there's a very clear mandate there um, for us to risk assess our gatherings. Um, the definition of gathering organiser is, is a bit circular. Um, uh, it puts manager as the manager or owner of the premises in which the gathering takes place. Um, the gathering organiser just says it's the person that's organised the gathering. Um, so for me, I think that just says there's a strong response, there's a strong argument for both parties in terms of a venue and the organiser to work together to create the risk assessment. Um, and until it's tested in law, we won't get any more than that. So I, I think that's important to, um, you know, to, to understand that, that there's, you can't kind of just manhand, push it off to somebody else it really does sit with um, both the, the venue and uh, a planner to pull together a risk assessment for a gathering uh, and a gathering, you know, in this instance is anyone over um, two people, but that might change. They might kind of um, put, start putting limits on that. But um, so we, we have a legal responsibility to do a risk assessment, keep people safe and follow the guidance. Straightforward. 
um, which should encourage this next bit, which is that we want people to lead from the top in, in COVID security. It shouldn't be something that's delegated down. Um, it, it should, you know, it's a huge culture shift really from being a relatively low risk industry to suddenly being quite a high risk industry. Um, if you consider in transmission and, and pandemic, we bring people together, uh, it's, it suddenly becomes high risk. Um, so we want decision makers to, to play their part in this. They might need to fork out some money, so they need to have the authority to make those kind of um, uh, decisions. And also possibly some sort of expectation management with clients who, who are expecting things to be a certain way and actually they need to be a little bit different from now on. Um, but also if you're leading from the top and if you're seen to be leading from the top, then you're going to get much better buy-in when it comes to the rest of your team uh, and you know the rest of your staff. So uh, if you do need to persuade people uh, higher than you that they need to get involved, then I think those legal arguments are a fairly strong um, reason. But also, you know, it, it's it's just good business management. It will be good for your um, public-facing persona to be seen to be, uh, you know, all over this kind of stuff. Uh, and it, it's it's really important for lots and lots of reasons. Um, the other thing uh, which is kind of tied into that is, is about starting the planning for COVID security right from the beginning of an event and not at the end. Um, you know, you might need more space, you might need different space, you might change the format, you might need much smaller rooms if you use smaller groups. Um, so there's lots of decisions that really should be made at venue finding stage. Um, rather than just going gung-ho into organising and, and recreating the event we did 18 months ago uh, and just, you know, plonking it in, in exactly the same format. There's a lot you can do with clever event design to reduce your risks so that possibly when you're actually on site, you can kind of get rid of all the other measures because you've done um, lots of clever things with smaller groups and staggered entry and workshop formats. You might have taken some of it online so that you've made it shorter. Uh, you might have been able to, you know, change lots of really close contact stuff to gamified networking or, you know, there's loads of stuff that you can do if you start early enough. That means that all the horrible stuff about queuing and masks and, and will be gone. So, you know, the more you can do early on, the better. But it also means that you allow yourself um, enough space physically in the venue and enough time for your build, um, for your you know, uh, rehearsals. Everything takes a little bit longer. Um, and I think the other point is that when they did all the pilot events uh, uh, recently, is that although for the audience everything was you know, no measures, well, you know, no visible measures, uh, no masks, no distancing, the crew were all expected still to work in a COVID secure way. So the build still had to be quite a long build. Um, so again, there's no point realizing that two weeks before the event, you need to have booked enough time when you book the venue. So do make sure that we're thinking about reinventing our events in a COVID secure way, rather than just trying to recreate them. Um, Part of the process, which kind of already comes from the, the legal requirement, is to consult our stakeholders and make sure that the whole network of suppliers, clients, um, staff are all working together to come up with these ideas and to come up with your rules or your, you know, your protocols. Because lots of reasons, again, you know, the more people are involved in something, the better their compliance will be because they, they feel part of the solution. So they're happier to go along with it. Um, but also they're gonna have better ideas. So, you know, I've been working with a team building company about how to reinvent what they do in a COVID secure way. And they're coming up with some amazing tweaks to their formats that I'd never have thought of. Um, so, you know, it's that kind of um, approach just means that everybody's working towards the same goal. Uh, and it also means that you know, you could be busy trying to work out a, a solution to a one-way system, but then you speak to the venue and they're like, oh, well, we've got a back of house corridor that we can open up. That's fine. You know, we'll, we'll make sure it's presentable and remove all the furniture. But, and, and all of a sudden, you know, that's a problem that you've solved together that you wouldn't have been able to solve on your own. Or if you had, you'd have had to come up with something that wasn't a great guest experience. So do make sure that you're, you're working with everybody 
um, throughout the process as well as your clients you know let make sure that decisions that affect their guest experience or their their speakers involve them and they're part of those solutions as well so that kind of covers our, our planning phase really of the event and then we get a bit more into the doing which is the assessing uh, and the actual kind of um, risk management uh, and the important thing here is to understand the hazard that we're dealing with um, so understanding transmission of the virus is really important um, but also being aware of the latest kind of infection rates uh, and the vaccination rates and your audience profile in relation to those. Um, you know, so at the moment, it's really um, amazing that the, va the vaccination is rolling out so fast. But if your audience are all going to be under 30, they're not going to be vaccinated at this point. You know, so, so keep an eye on, on how those two bits of information interact. Um, and also generally infection rates, you know, it's fantastic that they're so low. But if you've got a big event coming up, just keep an eye on them just to see that they're staying low. Um, so very quickly, in terms of transmission, you need to identify all three ways this virus can move at each point. So um, you're looking at direct transmission, you know, person to person, um, straight away, too close, for example. Um, droplets on surfaces, so surface transmission. Um, but most importantly for us and the environment in which we tend to operate, aerosol transmission is our biggest risk. Um, there was a, a, a paper published just a few days ago that kind of put the droplet, the surface transmission, incredibly low, uh, which we all kind of thought, but we needed something to prove it. So, so they have now got some scientific stuff behind that. So all this frantic cleaning is not necessarily actually reducing our risk that much. Hand washing, yes, because it's that, you know, root to, root to mouth thing, but the, the cleaning on surfaces is not necessarily. The main thing to focus on is aerosol transmission. Um, this sort of shows the buildup. If you're just standing quietly in a space breathing and you're infected, you will slowly build up a concentration of infected aerosols around you um, that basically can only be removed by a nice gust of fresh air or a, a fresh air ventilation system will, will definitely reduce the concentration um, and obviously if you left that room those aerosols remain um, so it's it's an incredibly important thing to be aware of and also what you're doing affects how many aerosols are generated so if you're standing silently not many if you're singing or shouting you produce an awful lot more um, and it will build up a lot faster. So there's certain activities, you know, that are, are higher risk uh, for aerosol transmission. And there's also risk factors about, um, you know, it's quite self-explanatory, but how many people are in a space? What's the ventilation? Are they wearing masks? How long are they together? Um, are they face to face or are they kind of back to back, side to side? So there's a, there's a lot of things that will affect aerosol transmission, but it is a, a key one that we need to focus on um, in the future, really. Hopefully, we want to see, and I've already seen a few, where venues have replied to the question, yes, we've upgraded our ventilation system. It's now a fresh air system, you know, suitable for COVID uh, transmission or COVID reduction. Um, so it's great to see that sort of stuff happening and hopefully that will be um, something that will come on and much more in the future. Um, after we've kind of looked at all our hazards, we know we, we're kind of identifying how this virus is going to move from person to person at these events. Um, we need to put some control measures in place to reduce the risk of that happening. Um, and according to the law, if you remember at the beginning, we are directed to the government guidance um, to tell us how to do that. So the guidance is um, issued on this coronavirus um, working safety during coronavirus website. And there's lots of different um, sector specific information that you can refer to and that you should refer to. There is also lots of crossover. So you can't just um, sit in the visitor economy, which is where business events are. You often then need to refer to um, restaurants, bars and uh, takeaways because that covers a lot of the hospitality and the dining guidance. Um, there's hotels, B&B, &B, guest accommodation. So there's something separate for them. 
There's a performing arts guidance. So if you're running something that's more considered a concert or a performance, then there's separate guidance for that. And then if you're a historical venue, uh, you know, there's separate guidance for that. So there's lots of times that things will um, interact with each other and cross over. Um, so it's it's important that you really understand where you fit in this guidance, which bits you need to keep your eyes on uh, and then get into the habit or nominate somebody in your organisation who is regularly checking this information. Um, they don't tell you when they're going to update it. Um, at the moment, we're getting a rough week before a step change. We get some new guidance. So that has now happened in line with the 17th of May. So we should get some um, you know, mid-June for the 21st of June. Um, but yeah, just keep checking back. You can click on see all updates just to see what's happened you know, since you last checked, if anything has happened since you last checked. Um, but it, it is a, an important place to be. Um, if you are following us on our channels or signed up to our uh, COVID hub, that's a good place to, um, to be because if stuff changes, we update it on our hub and then we date it. So you can see that it's come up recently. Uh, and we also send a mail up um, that just sort of says, oh, this has changed or we found this or this is new. Um, so that's a really good thing to be subscribed to at the moment, particularly because there's so much um, coming up. Um, and specifically as well, we've got a blog going live um, maybe today, hopefully, um, which is the sort of the, the frequently asked questions about step three uh, and what can we actually do and what are the guide, what's the guidance around food and drink and dining and receptions and all that kind of stuff. So uh, keep your eyes open for that if you're not already signed up. Um, in the government guidance, they link out to specific industry guidance. So this industry guidance that's named by the government has been written in conjunction with DCMS. So, you know, it's got that oomph. It's got the government behind it, if you like. There is more issued by all sorts of different agencies and all sorts of different associations. But the, the ones to focus on for me are the ones from the government guidance uh, which is the MIA, the AEO and the EIF. Um, I am going to have to turn those into a song at some point. Um, the MIA is the sort of more traditional corporate event, you know, hotels, venues, training, conferences, that sort of thing. AEO tends to be larger um, exhibitions, business and consumer exhibitions. And the EIF is focusing on outdoor events um, and festivals and things like that. So they're really good places to, to hang out. Other things that are re uh, relevant to our industry um, are TV and film at the moment. So you've got the APA, which it's, it's, it's the one that's been accepted by the industry, but it's not necessarily got the same um, governmental approval behind it. So it's, it's a weird one that stakeholders and, and clients may expect you to follow APA and suppliers may be following APA, but technically, the government guidance points out to the British Film Commission um, stuff. They're all very similar, to be fair, very similar. But that's just the you know the, where they all sit in the tree. And then PACT is more for live TV and filming, so ITV, BBC, that sort of thing. Um, they they sit there. There's also, and I've forgotten to put it on the slide, the Institute of Hospitality um, have issued uh, again government you know consulted guidance for hotels um, and restaurants. So that's the one to go to for them. Again, they change, they update them. So subscribe or, or do whatever you can to, to stay up to date. But again, they are featured on our hub. Um, so that's kind of where all your info is. We go into a lot more detail about what's, what's actually in there um, in our training courses. So we, we physically go through these are the measures. This is what's expected. This is how you're supposed to do it. Um, but for now, I don't have time to go into that. So that's your signposting to where it all is. Um, when you've got all that, you've assembled your risks, you've assembled your guidance, um, just be methodical. It's, it's a long process, but it's not a difficult process. So we recommend um, in our courses that people use a health and safety system, which is a plan, do, check, act. It's just one of those kind of you know funky little names, but it helps us to focus on a holistic approach to risk assessment instead of seeing it as a, a document just to you know complete on your own in a darkened room 
Um, it really needs to be this, yeah, this, this holistic approach. Uh, it helps to build um, consistency if you follow a, a system across your team. It helps you to, um, you know, make sure you're assessing all of the risk. And it also helps you to prioritize so that you're not focusing on things you know, that actually aren't that important. It helps you to really focus your attention on the things that you need to change or that you can change easily. Um, so the, the focus here as well is, is checking. This is a person-based risk. People carry this hazard. Um, so a lot of the stuff that we need to do is people-based measures. Um, and they people don't just do what you know people aren't robots unfortunately we can't just put put something in place and expect it to just magically work so there needs to be lots of communication I'll talk about in a minute lots of enforcement gentle enforcement lots of um, nudge behavior lots of uh, monitoring is stuff actually happening how we wanted it to do we need to change what we're doing so I think you know what we don't want is a risk assessment that's a wish list. People will follow a one-way system. People will queue. People will be socially distanced. Um, how? How are you going to make that happen? Because it's not enough from a health and safety perspective just to say it will happen. You know, inspectors would want to see you doing something to, to make it happen um, that is reasonably practicable. Um, so just make sure you're kind of thinking, is there anything else I can do that will make sure that happens? Um, you do, of course, get to a point where you go, no, I can't. I, I can only tell them so many times. I can only put so much signage up. I can only have so many staff. There comes a point where I've done everything I can. Um, but make sure you're at that point before you give up, <laughs> before you throw your hands up in the air. Go, well, they're not going to do it anyway. Um, so... Uh, the next thing is that we've actually got another risk for events, which is isolation impact. Um, and we mustn't forget that however low it is, I got a thing from the school yesterday, thankfully not my, not my kids' class, but there was a confirmed case in the school yesterday. Um, if that happens, uh, and it's, it is one of my children, or you know, it is you that's been in contact with someone at work, or... You, all of a sudden that's it you know you're at home for 10 days or until you get a negative test so don't forget that could happen um, and it could have a massive impact on what's happening with your event if it's your speaker your key speaker or you know one of your tech crew who's really specialist and it's hard to replace or if it's you or your lead event manager so just make sure that there's backup plans uh, in case somebody does you know, unexpectedly get uh, stuck at home for 10 days and ask your speakers what they, uh, suppliers, sorry, what they're doing to mitigate that risk um, as well. There's also things you can do to um, reduce the impact it has. So if you've got a group of event managers or speakers, don't put them all together in a car on the way to the event, because if one wakes up the next morning coughing, then they are all considered a close contact and they all have to isolate. So make sure you kind of treat, you need to start treating people like the royal family. So they don't travel together uh, and they can't kind of, you know, they shouldn't be uh, close together in the same room. Um, just make sure that you've considered the impact of um, uh, close contact working. So if you have established a close contact team or bubbles uh, in order to work safely, just make sure that if one of those people went, could you live without all of them? Or can you restructure your team to make sure you've still got people um, operating uh, after that? Um, so I mentioned it briefly before, but the next thing is about designing your communications because we've, we've thought about the risk, we've thought about the control measures, we've now done our assessment um, and we're happy that we know what we want to happen. But we need to tell people what we want to happen. Again, it's behaviour based stuff. So they need to know what's expected of them. Um, so it becomes the cornerstone of our um, risk assessment really is communication. It's also really important from a mental safety perspective that people, two things, they know what to expect. Um, a massive cause of anxiety, particularly now if people are just coming out for the first time, they've been working at home, you know, they've not even gone to the shops for, for a year. 
a massive source of anxiety is just not knowing what's going to happen, you know. So do videos. They're really good. If you're setting up or even fake it on a site inspection, this is what's going to happen when you arrive at the venue. You're going to be asked to sanitise when we're going to test you or not. Um, and you go through here and, you know, just make sure people know what to expect. And that will help to reduce their anxiety. The other thing it will do is reassure them that you're taking this really seriously and they will be safe at your event. So it's a it's an excellent um, approach to to make sure you're over communicating with people um, so that they know, you know, where the information is. You don't need to send your risk assessment out to your um, attendees. You do need to send it out to all of your staff, all of your suppliers, and ask them to make sure that all of their team have read it. Um, so either some sort of uh, signing sheet or, or um, we tend to run electronic registration that says, yes, I confirm I've read, read and will follow everything on your risk assessment. Um, but, but what you should do is link it for your guests, you know, send something nice and user friendly and graphic -y and, and, and pleasant, but a little link at the bottom that sort of says to view our full risk assessment, please click here. Um, that will massively help someone who is suffering with anxiety to be able to see just how much has gone into keeping them safe. Um, and like I said before, it's this nudge behaviour. So the earlier you can start explaining to people that things are going to be slightly different, the better compliance you're going to get. Um, so really, we'd, we'd say send something out with your invite, at least a statement that kind of says this event is being run under COVID secure principles and our full risk assessment will be available for you to view uh, closer to the event. Just, just acknowledging what you're doing um, right from the word go. There's there's a festival we're attending, I'm supposed to be going to from a personal perspective. Nothing, nothing. They're not even acknowledging the fact that, that COVID exists and that we might need to be a little bit different on site. And, and it's making me nervous, I don't like it. <laughs> Um, so it, it is important to make sure that you've got a, a transparent um, communication going with people, including your staff. And then finally, there's lots of fun technology available um, and coming on all the time to help us manage this uh, stuff. Um, COVID is a people risk. The more people you can get rid of, I'm afraid, the better. Uh, and you can replace them with technology. So, you know, can you take your whole registration process online? Yes, please. Let's not let's not have great big desks and stuff that's being handed out and forms and all that kind of thing. Let's have everything done um, beforehand. And, you know, people arrive with a QR code to confirm that they've done it and somebody scans them or even an automatic scanner scans them. You know, you can just buy, you have these um, freestanding scanners. They bid their QR code. I'm in. Off they go. You know, the the quicker it can be and the fewer people that there can be, the lower your inherent risk is. So that comes down to that planning stage again. You know, another reason why you start doing this at the beginning, because if you remove the risk of a person standing there, uh, you don't need to do anything else. Um, so, yeah, reducing contact, reducing the time, um, registration, apps, websites, the more stuff you can do using own devices. So you can, like I mentioned before, gamify things. You can get people viewing presentations or interacting with screens using their Bluetooth. You can do tons of cool stuff with um, own devices on Q&A and polling, uh, you know, get rid of mics and, and all that kind of rubbish and build it in. Once you've identified a need for a measure that's part of a safety thing, well, you've, you've paid for it now, you've got it there now, how else can we use this? Oh, what else can we do with it? You know, turn this, turn this all to your advantage. Um, there's some other social distancing things to do with beacons, um, probably less likely to be needed for audiences, but still relevant for crews, I think, um, you know, to maintain social distancing where they can. Uh, you could invest in, in the, the beacons. They're not that expensive that will flash when someone's too close. Um, you can do things with face recognition scanners, you know, for big, big exhibitions. Um, but also think about your comms on site. Uh, a, a reason to kind of end up clumping together is because people need to whisper in corners and have quiet little conversations. So, you know, encourage uh, the use of in-ear um, Bluetooth headsets or, or radios, you know, some kind of way of communicating without having to, to get really close to each other, again, because of that isolation impact that it could have too. 
Um, so that's my, my whistle stop tour through the, the main principles of, of a um, COVID secure event. As I mentioned a couple of times, we have got two training courses that look into all of that in a lot more detail. Um, the first one is a uh, for event planners who have to carry out these risk assessments. So it goes into lots of detail around the guidance, around how to physically carry out the assessment, um, what measures you need to take. Uh, and that includes a live workshop um, that's led by me. Uh, for everybody else who, who still absolutely needs to know about this, who needs to know the science, the guidance, the um, the legislation, what to expect in a risk assessment, you know, what kind of things and what what is their part, you know, at, at client level, at supply level, what part do they play in this process? Um, we've got a much shorter online only um, course. It's two hours of self-directed learning. So you can do it in 10 minute chunks or you can sit down and do it in two hours. Um, and at the moment, we've actually got a discount code available for that course. So we're not doing discounts on the other one because it's, it's getting really busy now, I'm afraid. Um, but the, the online only course does have a 20% discount available at the moment. Um, so you can use the code webinar20 uh, and that will be valid uh, for a week. Well, it's until May the 17th. I thought the step date was probably a good, uh, a nice nice date to keep that one too. So if, if anyone you know, or you want to sign up for that short one, you can get the discount. Um, the other thing is if you've got big events or if you want to sort of just set yourselves up with um, a framework, a procedures document, this is how we're going to operate in the future. Um, I'm doing lots of consulting with clients who are doing that already. So they want to get ready. They want to get out for their clients and say, here's our procedures. We're ready to go live. So you can you can do that um, or we do physical risk assessments event by event. So, you know, if you want any help with that, do just give us uh, a shout. The links there are, are for our LinkedIn, our website, our training course. So follow us. Like I said, there's lots of stuff comes out on our channels to keep everyone up to date on all of this. So um, we, we think it's a lot of value. Um, so we hope that you would too.